this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and our engineer, Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is a much sought-after director, occasional producer, and a popular and versatile actor of films and television. You know his work from movies like Oh God, You Devil, Sheena, the Tim Conway, Harvey Corman vehicle, the Long Shot, and Blake Edwards, The Curse of the Pink Panther. But he made his most lasting impression on the small screen in hit shows like Blossom, a program he also directed, and of course, as the slow-witted gangster Danny Dallas on one of the most memorable and controversial series in the history of the medium, Soap. In the early 1990s, he decided to move behind the camera and since directed dozens of pilots and TV movies as well as episodes of the most well-respected series on television, including Coach, Caroline in the City, Less Than Perfect, Spin City, Two and a Half Men, The Big Bang Theory, Till Death, Scrubs, Everybody Hates Chris, Rules of Engagement, and Mom. In a career spanning five decades, he's worked with David Niven, Sir John Gilgood, Tony Randall, James Coburn, Billy Crystal, Carrie Fisher, Roger Moore, Jonathan Winters, John Cleese, and George Burns, as well as previous podcast guests, Andrew Bergman, Craig Bierko, Louis Black, John Biner, Peter Rieger, Marion Ross, Robert Wagner, and last but never least, our mutual pal, Richard Kind. Please welcome to the show a gifted actor and director and a man who once co-starred in a TV pilot about the Bible, narrated by Raymond Burr. (laughs) The very funny Ted Wash. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What an intro. Thank you so much. That's, uh, that's not only everyone I've ever worked with, but everyone I think I've ever known in my life. <laughs> Ted, what about this Bible uh, pilot with Raymond Burr before we move past this? Oh, my Which God. Which I'm sure you're was... not asked about often. Wow, that's a deep dig, guys. Uh, kudos to you. Uh, I knew you were deep diggers, but this one, this is... Um, it's 50 yeah, years this old. This called The Story of Esther. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a biblical telling of the story of Esther, and I played Esther's boyfriend. Um, <laughs> Esther was played by <laughs> <laughs> Olivia Hussey. Oh, Gil- absolute- Gilbert loves Olivia Hussey. Oh, he's just exquisite. She was so beautiful, still is so beautiful. And uh, and uh, I think I got killed off about halfway through. So I, but it was I think it was my first television film for television. Seventy nine, fifty years ago. Yeah. Gilbert, all your favorites were in it. Harris Eulin, Olivia, oh. Olivia Hussey, Tony Musante from The Incident. Wow! And here's the punchline, Nehemiah Persoff. Excellent! <laughs> oh, Nehemiah Persoff, the cabbie from On the Waterfront. You bet. Oh, my God. Yes, I, yes! Isn't he still with us? I think Nehemiah Persoff's 101. A, yeah. I think he's still kicking, Ted. I think I'm, so. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. And now, now did, uh, did each episode start off with... The Bible was filmed in front of a live audience. <laughs> it was only one episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, that was just one episode, and I think that was more than enough to tell that story. Yeah. And, uh... well, well, wait a minute. I want to jump off this. You also made a pilot called Handle with Care, which was a female version of MASH. Do you have any memory of this? Oh, my in God. In 77. 
with Dick Yarmy, Don Adams' brother. Wow, Yarmy's army. And Dee Dee Khan and Brian Dennehy. Yes, Dee Dee. Oh, Brian Dennehy was in Dee, that. That's Dee right. Dee Khan, oh, that... you light up my life, isn't yeah, it? That... Yeah. Yes and, yes, and she was in Greece. She was in the movie Greece. Yes. That was probably the second thing I did. Uh, out here in California, in Los Angeles in 1977. And um, I, I was just a guest star. I played, I think it was the Korean War. I played a soldier. Corporal Tillingham. Corporal Tillingham. Oh, my God. I, I, I showed up for work with my long hair, and the producers instantly said, oh, no, you, this is a war thing. You have to cut all your hair off. And I said, gee, I just got the California. Can I keep it? And so they were uh, kind enough to give me a head wound. So my whole role was two days of lying in a cot with a bloody wow. gauze uh, bandage around my head going, oh, I'm not going to make it. Didi Khan, love me, please. And <laughs> Uh, I like doing oh these, these deep digs. Now, was it that... Unsold TV pilots. Dee Dee Khan mouthed the words to you light up my life. I don't know. She was Frenchy in Greece. That's all I yeah. know. Yeah. I'm, I, I'll probably cut this part out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lovely, too. I think she's married to David Shire, the co- famous composer. Oh, is she? That's interesting stuff. I may be incorrect about that. So wait, uh, she's the one who used to be married. He used to be married to uh, Talia. To Talia Shire, is that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, Talia. Yeah, he he did the music for the conversation with Gene Hackman. Very good. See, yeah, he's a jazz pianist. See how we leap around, Ted. I, you know, Talia Shire uh, was guest starred on Blossom, and uh, ah. we played opposite each other. So how about that for a deep dig? Very cool. Excellent. Very, She's very lovely. cool. Yeah. Now, before we get to anything else about your fucking career. <laughs> 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 you had something to say about me. Oh, Frank yes. This was a very lovely thing that Ted said on the phone, and I didn't share it with him, Ted, so he's hearing it for the first yes. time. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, Gilbert. And his wife know, is I'm, listening, too. All right. I'm a fan of your work and always have been, but... Um, in early 1993, my wife of many years passed away after a long fight with cancer. I had two young children, and um, our comfort viewing was Aladdin. And we watched Aladdin two, sometimes three times a day. And it gave us such relief and so much fun and took us away from what we'd been through. And to this day, when my children hear your voice, it gives them comfort. It makes them feel at ease. So I thought that was an interesting little piece about you that you might not have ever heard about your speaking voice. <laughs> what a nice thing. Oh, God. I, I I hate when I can't say something snarky and obnoxious. <laughs> afterwards. That's a lovely thing to share, that, Ted. That's a beautiful story. That's yes. beautiful. Thank well, they you, hear you Ted. now doing one of your comedy bits, and my 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 older daughter will go, "Oh my God, that's Iago! Oh, that's Iago! I love him so." <laughs> <laughs> and, and your late wife was the actress Janet Margolin, and we were talking about her before we came on. And David uh, uh, Gilbert was a fan of David and Lisa. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. You're Could you're you're a little gray mouse in a little house. She was she like was, someone who she could only speak in rhymes. That's exactly right. Yeah, wonderful she was actress. Lisa and David and Lisa was the first uh, considered, I guess, by some people, the first independent movie to really do well, and um, it was a, a, a classic. Frank of Perry. independent film. So yeah, she had, she was versatile. She was very good in comedies. She's in two Woody Allen comedies. Very funny in Take the Money and Run. Very funny. Yep, and she's in Annie Hall too. Plays his second wife and. Uh, doesn't like the sirens going off in the city. Yes, yeah. two more chairs and they've got a dining room set. <laughs> She's the ex-wife. And she was very pretty. Beautiful. Yeah. And what Nevada Smith with, with Steve McQueen. I mean, really terrific career. Yeah, and, and uh, Maura Turi with Marlon she Brando. She made a movie with Brando. And, and Brenner. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just lots and lots of different things. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah great talent. Well, thank beautiful, you for beautiful that lady. story. Well, I hope that's meaningful. It certainly was to us, so it still is. So, it's very sweet. I'm sh- not sure anyone has ever complimented him on the, on his dulcet tones, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Uh, maybe I'll play the Bill Cosby bit for my daughter and oh, say, is this okay. the same guy? No, they'll, they'll solution them. Play, play the aristocrats for them. Oh, that's great, yes. Oh, I love that. Let's, let's, let's go back a little bit, and we'll jump around like crazy. By the way, I also wanted to point out that Ted is one of those polite guests then, that, when notified about the show, actually does his homework and starts listening to the show. So Jeez. We, we did a little pre-interview on the phone. He told me, he, what was it, the Erwin Winkler episode you got into? Erwin Winkler and RJ. I loved them oh, both. Oh, you listen yeah. to RJ, because you work with RJ. Yes. Yeah. A couple Twice. of times now. A couple of times. So yeah. the guests do research on this show, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> what else is new? Five, five <laughs> minutes before we record, I'm, I'm leaning in with Frank going, so what does he do, he acts? <laughs> well, it seems to be working for you, Gilbert. I wouldn't change your mode here. So, uh, uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about you working with RJ and on the Panther movie and also directing him later in life. Yeah. Yes. Now, you we'll were, get to that. You were uh, in a film that I, uh, I'm proud to say I jerked off to. Oh, God. Uh, this Not is that one. Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. It's a beauty, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Yes. Well, I mean, Tanya Roberts, I will say, killer fucking body. Beautiful lady. And more importantly, a Jew. Yes, true. And abs yes, absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. And in that loincloth, uh, she just couldn't be beat. She was really exquisite. And there's one scene where she... You've seen Sheena. Yeah, Gilbert, she, I'm takes, she takes the loincloth off for us to go skinny dipping in front of you. And it's like, oh, Jesus Christ. Yes, it was a, it was a show-stopping moment. The entire crew was uh, very, uh, very apt that day. Um, <laughs> and of course, you know, the, the innocent Sheena has no sense of... You know, taking off her clothes is uh, anything that's, uh, you know, improper. Right. So she's, <laughs> she's just in the river, the so <laughs> rubbing it up, you know, <laughs> singing a little song. <laughs> I'm having a wash. Oh, why aren't you taking off your clothes and jumping in? And, of course, my guy is a contemporary guy and just, like, his jaws dropped down. But, yeah, we had a lot of fun on that. Did you make that in Kenya? <laughs> yeah, we yeah. made it in Kenya, yeah. We were there for... Four and a half, almost five months. Jeez. I was listening to an interview with you, and you were talking about that. What, one of the things that disillusioned you over time or got made you disenchanted about acting was your, your first, first, your first picture, you're in Europe for months. Your second picture, you're in Africa for months. You, you wound up being away from home a lot. Yeah, but I will say this is that is that for that period of time, uh, my family came with me on both of those trips. Ah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, my 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 son who's 37 now and a, a successful composer and director and writer um uh was a little baby and he came to to England with me and Janet and then uh, and then we all went to uh, Kenya for for the duration of that. So we had a lot of fun. Was there you told me on the phone there was a first of all first of all the director John, uh, John Gearman. Gillerman. John yes. Gillerman. I never knew yes. how to say his name. John Gillerman directed The Towering Inferno and yeah. King Kong. Yeah, two two hey, it, two mega hits back and back to back. <laughs> yeah, I mean they both made money. King Kong is maligned, but it was a profitable yeah. film. Well, they I uh, the story was that they were the he it was the first two hundred million dollar movies, first director to make hundred million dollar box office movies. Um, he made a lot of other good movies too. Um, the Towering Inferno was still fun fun to watch, and yeah. King Kong is fun too. They of course they've remade it now a bunch of times. Absolutely, but, uh, he was quite a character. Mr. Gillum, and he's no longer with us. Yes. He's quite a character. Was and Frank ahead, was telling me that uh, he got into some fist fights on the set. Well, you know, there was something that occurred. Tanya Roberts was married to a lovely man named Barry at the time, and something had happened at a New Year's Eve dinner. I wasn't there that night, and Gillerman and Barry were both upset about something, and I don't know what happened. But we're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, the kind of place that you have to drive an hour to get to the airstrip and then fly another two hours and then drive another hour to get to this location. It's in the middle of nowhere. And there's hundreds and hundreds of people working on the set, carrying things. And we're sitting under a little tent, and I'm sitting there with uh, with uh, with Barry, and he's trying to tell me the story about the New Year's Eve fiasco. And John Gillerman comes walking up, 
starts to enter the tent, and Barry shifts the tone of his voice very drastically from being loud and telling me this story about uh, how inappropriate John was to being very quiet. And John Gillerman knew exactly what was happening. He was being talked about. So he said, go ahead, Barry. What were you talking about? And Barry said, about you, you asshole. And John <laughs> tried to kick him in the ass through a director's chair. And Barry jumped up, and they started oh, putting their fists up. And John tried to push past me, and he reached into a crate of Schweppes tonic water and grabbed two bottles out and tried to smash them on the rock. And they wouldn't break, and he hit him a second time and a third time, and then finally they broke, but Barry was being taken away. And these two guys are arguing in the middle of nowhere about nothing, and Gillerman's got broken bottle stubs going, I'll rip your balls out, you punk. And <laughs> <laughs> Barry was, I'll kick your ass, I'll kick your ass. and Movie making. It, Everybody stopped working and watched these two guys, and they were still yelling at each other from, you know, hundreds of feet away. And insanity on a movie set yeah, in yeah. the middle of nowhere on 102 degrees. A lot of talent associated with that movie. I mean, the great Lorenzo Semple Jr., who wrote Parallax View and Papillon and Three, three, three Days, days, of, days the of the Condor and David Newman. Yeah who wrote super, a Superman movie for Donner and Bonnie and Clyde. You turned it down initially? Well, yeah, I wasn't sure about the script. I wasn't sure about the role. I didn't understand what the tone of it was going to be. I'd already been in the Pink Panther movie, mm -hmm. and, you know, the Panther wasn't successful. And I thought, oh, I don't know that I want to be in another big budget, because it was a big budget movie, action movie. I don't know if I really want to be in something that I don't really understand. And then... I went in to see my, my mega agent, Marty Baum, and I was going to say to him, I, I don't really understand this script, and I'm not sure that this is the right project for me. And the next thing I remember, I was on a plane to Africa. So somewhere along the line, I got seduced into doing it. And uh, Was it Semple who changed your mind? Uh, I wish I could say it was Semple. I uh -huh. remember... Semple and uh, John Gillerman and the producer and Tanya and I had a meeting one night, and there were so many arguments happening uh, uh, before we even started shooting. And at one point, I looked over at Lorenzo, and he had the collar of his his polo shirt in his mouth, and he was chewing on it because he was so stressed out about what was happening in our little script conference meeting. And we hadn't even begun shooting, so it was it was a rough road that one. But still, we had a lot of laughs. Yeah, what an experience. Yeah, but I almost got killed by a rhinoceros in that show. <laughs> by the way. Excellent! Oh, How did this happen? I was going to ask you about wild animals. Well, this was uh, for for there was a scene where where uh, Sheena wants to run off by myself and doesn't want me to follow her, so she takes a stick and draws a circle around my Range Rover and says, "This is a magic circle. Do not walk out of it." And uh, and she runs off, and I go, "Well, what does that mean?" So I start to run after her, and I. Here's something in the shrubs, and I look over, and it's a rhinoceros. And the rhinoceros walks up to the edge of the circle and gives me a look, and then he runs off and terrifies me so I don't leave the circle. So for weeks and weeks, they had a rhinoceros that they'd flown over from Thousand Oaks, California. His air bill was $54,000 to get him over there, and they had a run for him, and the belief was is if they let him out of his crate and kind of goosed him along this very narrow run, by the time he got to the place where the clearing was, where my car, the Range Rover was, and, and the Magic Circle was, that, that he would stop because he was winded. And um, I have this video at home because wow. a, a friend of mine was shooting it. You can see that the rhino comes out of the shrubs, and I'm lying on the ground in front of this Range Rover, and I can't hear, I can't see anything, but I can hear a first AD going, he's coming up the trail. He's coming up the trail. He's almost at the end of the trail. And literally, from in front of my car, a rhinoceros, it was like he magically appeared. And instead of stopping and taking a breath, he charged at me. Wow. And uh, I have this piece of video. You can, uh, I'll show it to you or send it to We'd you sometime. We'd love to see it. Yeah. It's, it's really amazing because just before the take, I decided I would unlock an, the door to the Range Rover and open the window. And when I saw him come after me, I just stuck my arm in the car and I dove in. And you can see his tusk going by the door as I dive into the 
Range Rover. It was really close. Wow. So yeah. those those rhinoceroses can really move. They're surprisingly fast and more <laughs> you, agile. You found than, out. Yeah, uh, with a brain the size of a walnut. So they're not trainable. They don't they don't work well with others. <laughs> No. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back for a. By the way, we found this interesting too: as actresses who had turned it down, uh, this, the part of Sheena before um, <laughs> Bo Derek, Raquel Welch. This then this one strikes me as odd. Jodie Foster. Do you know anything about this? Uh, no, but the other two had already been in loincloth. Why did they need to do it again? Exactly. You know? Good point. And, Good point. And Raquel Welch is one of those people. Uh, you know, legendary sex symbol who has never once showed a thing. She has never. It's it's always been. She's always been a cock tease for Kel Welch. Well, she sure is gorgeous. I directed her in an episode of Spin City, and she was exquisite. So, she is beautiful. Not in a loincloth, though. I. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> Ted was, was in a loincloth, but. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, we jump around, and I want to go back, Ted. When you came to New York, first of all, you're from the Midwest, from the Chicago area. You came to New York, and I'll come back later to this, because I want to ask you about your rock bands, too, and about singing opera, which we also find interesting. Oh, my goodness. But this jumped out at me. One of your first gigs in New York uh, was a show about Christopher Columbus with you and drag. Do I have this right? Yes, it was my first uh, first role in New York. There was uh, a theater company there that uh, was going to put on the Michael de Gelderode play Columbus, which is not a musical. Okay. But uh, they had decided to make it a musical. And um, I auditioned for it, and I got the role of Queen Isabella. And I sang an aria in drag to Columbus. <laughs> That's great. I gave him the three ships, and he gave me a big kiss. That was my first my first experience, theatrical experience in New York. It was so much fun. But I remember my stepfather thinking, saying to me, you know, I'm not so sure about this acting business. You know, there's a lot of strange people in it. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I remember thinking, I don't think I'll invite him to New York for this first one to see me in drag getting kissed on the lips. So, uh, but... It was a lot of fun. We had an awful lot of fun. Now now I'm going to have to put you on the spot, as I do with all our guests. Yes, Can sir. you sing just a little piece of an aria for you, us? Oh you, my do God. you still do it, Ted? <laughs> you know, I, it's something that you need to do about an, at least an hour a day to stay in shape. Uh-huh. And I am not in shape, so put me on the spot about something else. Okay. <laughs> <you do> it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's the <laughs> most unpleasant? <laughs> And it'll live forever, Gilbert, so please, no. <laughs> you told me uh, you worked with an opera lover. You worked with Tony Randall. And you, oh, you told me that he that you guys, back in those days, I guess you were still you were still working on your voice. You were still training it. Yes. And he would yeah. he would ask you what Gilbert just asked you? He would ask you to... Yeah, he, he, he loved to sing opera, and I have a tenor voice, and he's a baritone, so we were... He always wanted me to learn little pieces of of great uh, baritone tenor duets and and you know we'd be in between takes or something and he'd say come on ted come on let's do it let's do it let's do it for everybody and tony randall was just not somebody you could say no to he was just irrepressible so we would sing for everybody and they would kind of feign like oh this is really wonderful <laughs> that's great <laughs> opera in calabasas this is what a thrill <laughs> I, I wish you had that like the rhino video <laughs> <laughs> I think I managed to burn every copy. So well, you were a confident guy. I mean, I've read interviews with you, and you said you were fearless in those days. You had a lot of confidence. You would go into an audition and just believe that you were going to get the part. Yes, that's 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 true. I was I was well trained. I spent three and a half years at what was then called the Goodman School of Drama, mm-hmm. and I was a classically trained actor. And I felt like there wasn't anything uh, I couldn't do as an actor and so uh uh, i went to new york full of confidence and you know after a short time after i did my my uh, queen isabella stint i went down to florida and did some dinner theater and then came back and auditioned for greece Mm -hmm. uh with about 699 other people and uh i didn't even have an equity card at the time and i got the part of danny zuko replaced danny zuko 
Amazing. You must yeah. have had a lot of confidence and to, and to beat out 500 actors. Well, you know, we weren't thinking. I wasn't thinking about them. I was just thinking about me. But yeah, it was it was uh, it was uh, a great time. And and also, if you were a young actor in New York, there weren't a lot of opportunities. You know, I mean, you could be in Godspell or you could be in Greece or you know whatever the young young people shows that were running. But uh, it was a great place to start. All really your predecessors great. in that part in the Danny Zuko part too. Some names there. Some people. Uh, well, Barry Bostwick, I think, was the original. Peter. Barry Boswick created the part. Created the part. Is, yeah, he's great. Great actor and a great dancer and a great singer. And Peter Gallagher and Treat Williams. Yes, I, I, I replaced Treat. Peter Gallagher replaced me. How about that? Yeah. The what a murderer's goes row. On. Yeah, uh, well, and the, the man who played the part second after Barry Boswick was the late Jeff Conaway, who was also a tremendous singer-actor right. and so handsome. Right. Oh, my goodness. And yeah. then became Kanicki. And became Kanicki and was on Taxi and yeah. So you're you're full of confidence. You're getting you're getting these parts. I mean, it wasn't even that long after you decided to be an actor because you were you were a musician. Well, yeah, I was a musician in high school. I had rock and roll bands from the time I was eleven until I at the end of high school, and then I was in the school musical and decided I liked it and found after when well, high school was ending. I needed to get a, a high school diploma. I was a couple of credits short. I was a little bit of an underachiever. So I got my diploma from high school and then went to the Goodman School of Drama. And like I said, they trained me so well. All I wanted to do when I was graduating from Goodman was to be a young leading man in a repertory company. That's yeah. all See, I wanted. I like that. It, it's funny. You remind me, like, I always thought, uh, the thing I always say about my early days is like, I had stupidity on my side. You know, you go, oh, uh, uh, oh, the, what, there's a few billion other people who want this part. Oh, all right. <laughs> it didn't occur fine. to either of you, right? The, the, yeah. the, the level of competition. We don't know what we don't know. Right. Right? And there's an awful lot of relief in that sometimes when uh, you get the sense that something scary's out there, but you don't really know what it is. You can be intimidated by it or you can just play through, so... These were serious acting students, too, because I heard you say that that maybe a couple of people in the company harbored movie star fantasies, but nobody thought, everybody thought getting a job in TV was selling out. Yes, it was interesting because uh, there weren't, there weren't as many people crossing over from television into movies at that point, you know? Uh, it started to happen a little bit later. I think Travolta was one of the first who really crossed over from uh, you know, Welcome Back Cotter and then yeah. was... You know, a huge movie star. Uh, most people kind of felt like if you get on a television series, that'll that'll type you as a as a small screen person. So when I came out to California in 1977 to Los Angeles in 1977, I really didn't want to be on a television series. I wanted to try and find my way into the movies, and then uh, I was sent the pilot script to soap, and everything my, changed. Everything <laughs> changed. <laughs> yeah. And I always, I mean, you had a chance to work with great people, but I always found something in the later years of the Pink Panther movies, uh, something very ghoulish about Blake Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> what, about trying to keep it alive? Yeah. yeah. Peter Sellers is dead. Uh, David Niven, I think, had ALS. So he couldn't speak, and they had Rich Little doing like what sounded like a Ronald Coleman. In Ted's movie. Yes, yeah. yes. That. And they were using like previously shot footage with him going, I remember the time. And you go, well, he wasn't in that movie. How does he remember the time? Yeah, well, th there were, Blake made two movies uh at the same time, he made a wraparound movie that was an homage to Peter called Trail of the Pink Panther. Ah, yes. That was about an investigative journalist trying to find where he'd gone. And, and she'd come in contact with somebody and would go, oh, I remember the time he was squashing grapes at the thing. And then they'd cut back to some outtake that they had done that I guess maybe hadn't been good enough to make it into a movie at that <laughs> oh, point. Oh, sorry. Okay. He's using outtakes at this point. Outtakes. <clears throat> And then he was making my movie, Curse of the Pink Panther. Uh, uh, and that was a first-run movie, but it had all the same old characters in it, the great characters in it. Um, 
And there's, you know, there's the story that I heard about that movie was that a few years before Curse of the Pink Panther, Blake and Peter had decided that they just didn't want to work together anymore. They really didn't get along well. And so they both went to MGMUA and said, we want to make Pink Panther movies, but we don't want to work with each other anymore. And apparently, MGMUA said, Peter, you can make a movie without Blake, but Blake, we don't want you to make one without Peter. And they paid Blake a large sum of money. Peter had a script in development, was about three months uh, away from going into principal photography. I think it was called The Romance of the Pink yes, Panther. Yes, that's I'm not correct. Sure. And he died. And MGMUA had a Pink Panther movie on their schedule for the next summer. And apparently they went to Blake at that point and said, Hey, Blake, would you, uh, would you like to make a Pink Panther movie for us now? And that was kind of the setting of how we went into that film. You know, I think he had a little bit of um, uh, mixed feelings, I guess, maybe about, about making it in terms of what he'd been through with the studio guys. So. Yeah. Well, but we, what a cre- what a creative force and what a genius! Oh, he what was amazing. He yeah. absolutely was. I and mean, were you a fan up until that point? I mean, had you seen the Panther pictures, all the Panther pictures, and things oh, like, things I, like the Great Race? And oh, I'd seen all the Panther Breakfast at Tiffany's. pictures. I'd seen everything. It was just you know, experiment and terror. I love experiment and terror. I, oh my God! Yeah. You know, he's, Lee his range. His range is a uh, as a as a director was huge. It was huge, and the fact that he could do the deft kind of comedy and that worked with Peter and made the, uh, up to that point, was the most uh, successful comedy series of movies ever. And then I he mean, could make something just, like Days of Wine and Roses. Days of the Wine and Roses. The versatility of them. Yes. And then they had, at one point, they had uh, Roberto Benigni as Cluso. Later, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Blake tried it again later on with Roberto Benigni. I guess it didn't work. You know, I was, <laughs> I was recalling a story when I went to Pinewood Studios to make the Pink Panther movie that I was going to be in. I went into the makeup room of the great makeup artist Harry Frampton, who had done all of uh, Peter Sellers' great disguises. And lining the shelves of this room, there must have been 40 wax life-size heads impressions of Peter Sellers. And it was for a scene that we were going to do later on where I go to uh, uh, Cluzo's apartment and Cato has turned it into the Cluzo Memorial Museum and is charging people to come in. But he's got life-size replicas of Peter in all of his greatest disguises. And I break into the apartment and then walk around for a bit and then Cato attacks That's yeah, one of the and, funnier scenes in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have a great fight. It yeah. was so much fun. I we were just watching it. I was, it. Getting, I was <laughs> getting to do a, a fight with Kato with Bert Kwok. <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> Excuse me. We just watched it. It's a really funny sequence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that where you turned to Blake and said, is this a good idea? Just- yeah, when I, when I first walked onto the set <laughs> and there was me standing face to face with all of the genius of Peter Sellers, I, I, I said to him, are we sure this is a great idea? You really want to bring me face to face? And I remember him saying something like, kid, all you got to do is remember what color Mercedes you want. No, I'm sorry. Kid, all you have to do is know what color Rolls Royce you want to have. That's it. Wow. That's what he said. Well, he had Could seen it. you. Let's take it back because he had seen yeah. you in Soap, play, yes. playing Danny in Soap. He said that he, he that he and Julie Andrews were fans of yours, and that's that's how you got called into the meeting with him in the first place. Yeah, it's kind of a funny story in that my managers. I just gotten back from New York, uh, doing their playing our song on Broadway, and I was hoping to get a part in a movie. And my managers called me and said, "Don't ask us how we did it, but we got you in to see Blake Edwards. He's doing a Pink Panther movie. Go in and make a good impression, and maybe he'll give you a part." So I went in to see Blake, and while I was in the waiting room, I could hear someone in the room just destroying that room with laughter. I could hear muffled, and then I could hear three or four people just laughing and laughing and laughing. And it went on for 20 minutes, and I was thinking, I can't go in there. I don't even know who this is. And the door finally opened, and it was Martin Mull. And I've told him this story a couple times now, that that. I almost couldn't go in because whatever he was doing in there was so funny. Um, and I went in and sat down, and Blake said, Hey, hi, it's really nice to meet you. Julie and, uh, Julie and I are big fans of yours. I've got this idea for a Pink Panther movie. Um, 
And so here's what here's the idea. And he starts to tell me the whole story. This guy does this, and he does that, and he goes over here. Now he's like six, seven, eight minutes into telling me the story, and I, I really, I, I don't know where I'm going to fit in this movie, you know, okay. because, and f- he finishes telling me the story, and he goes, I think this would be a great part for you. Will you do it? And I went, yeah, I would, I would do it. I would, I would do it. He said, I'm going to be honest with you. I wanted Dudley, but Dudley won't even return my phone calls now. I made him a big star with 10, and he's booked now for the next 10 years, and I can't even get him on the phone. So I'm sure they'll give me who I want, and I want you to do it. And I thought, okay. I went home. I called my agents. They said, how did it go? I said, he offered me the part. And my agent said, he did not offer you the part. Are you out of your mind? Everybody wants that role. <laughs> they didn't role. believe you. And the next day I got another call to go back and see Blake again. So I went back and I sat in his office for about an hour. And then finally someone opened the door. And I went into Blake's office and he said, uh, hey, thanks for coming back. Do you see that pair of glasses over there on that table? I said, yeah. And he said, put them on. And I put on this pair of glasses and he just burst into laughter. And he called for the producer, Tony Adams. Tony, Tony, come in here. Tony, Tony Adams came running in. Blake said, look at Ted. And Tony started laughing. The two of them are laughing and laughing and laughing. And finally, Blake goes, okay, okay. Take take the glasses off and leave them. You, you'll be hearing from us. And I left and I thought, what the hell was that? Like, I had no idea <laughs> what that could have been about. My agents called and said, what happened? I said, he asked me to put on a pair of glasses, and he thought it was funny. And they went, all right, this is just crazy. And literally a week later, they offered me a six-picture deal. So Six pictures, um, six Panther movies. Yeah, we only made one, though. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> only made one. <laughs> Clifton Slay. You know, it's not intimidating enough that you're following in the footsteps of, of uh, arguably, you know, one of the greatest comedians of our time. The greatest physical comedians of our time, but then he tells you, "Oh, I really wanted Dudley Moore." <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, that uh, again, that didn't bother me. Didn't you know? bother I mean, you? Du- no, no, it was like fine if you could get Dudley, but and, and I also knew that I was going to get creamed. You know, like you just um, there was a big part of me that was going, "Yeah, don't replace Peter Sellers. Not in this part. He's a titan in this part. You just don't." But you know. 30, 40 years down the line, are you going to kick yourself if you don't do this? Like, are you really going to pass up this opportunity? And I thought, again, you know, no, I'm going to do this. You don't know what you don't know. Of course. I don't think you could have passed it up, especially given the adventure and the people you got to work with. Oh, God, I spent... The Month, one yeah. you worked with who was equally good in comedy as well as drama was, and i always a fan of his, was Herbert Lom. Great Herbert Lom. Oh, God, Herbert Lom was so funny. We Frank and I were talking about yeah. that great scene, and I think it's Revenge of the Pink Panther where, the dentist. where Cluzo plays the dentist, and his nose starts to melt, and he gives Lom a big I, shot of laughing gas, and the two of them are just laughing. And it's one of the great scenes of all time. But he is so funny, and he was still doing the twitchy thing. Uh, <laughs> but then he was also, <laughs> it was so funny, though, because he's like a very uh, educated, very erudite person, you know? So he'd do this face twitching in the scene and then he'd go, have you decided where you're going to dine while you're here in the south of France? And you must book a reservation. And he would give me all these restaurants and it just, the incongruity of, (laughs) you know, his willingness to be just a lowbrow comedian (laughs) and still be He was a good cultured guy. I mean, first he played Phantom of the Opera. Uh, Yes. Which which you know. Yeah. A a very bright guy. I think that's, um, I I think it's uh, Pink Panther Strikes Again. Actually, where the where where he's the, where he does the the dentist thing, the laughing gas, and and Sellers has the disguise that's melting. Yes, <laughs> he has they pulled were, the wrong tooth. Yeah, yes, great, so funny. great together. Another actor I'm a fan of, uh, who is just basically known as Boss Hogs from uh, Oh yeah, Boss Hog, yeah, fr- from uh, Dukes of Hazard, and that Sorrel book. Yeah, Sorrel book. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. he played. Uh, he played the Godfather, my on, Godfather on soap. on soap. Yep, yep. Big fan of his. Why do you oh, remember was, about him? I just remember what a funny actor he was and what a kind gentleman he was. I remember 
there was a scene, a moment in a scene that we played together where he's giving me instructions of somebody he wants me to kill or something. And, and somebody, one of his henchmen walks in and gives him this little brown paper bag, a lunch bag. And he opens it up and he goes, what is that? Is that a finger? And the, <laughs> and the henchman yells, nods yes, and he goes, you know, the next time Loopy you wax a guy, tell him I'll take his word for it. Don't bring me any more fingers. <laughs> <laughs> but those are Su- Susan Harris's great words. You know, oh, she she's wrote that. brilliant. She wrote the whole first season all by herself and most of the second. So she's an incredible writer and a genius and a friend. So um, We'll come back to Soap, but I got a couple of more Panther uh, uh, questions just, just, okay. just before we move on. Uh, you, the people that you got to work with, and we were talking on the phone, and you said, you know, what you, when, what you just said, I didn't want to miss this grand adventure. Looking back, I've heard you say that I wish the movie had been successful, obviously, but I don't regret spending time in the company of these people. You know, the first, the first scene that I did in Europe was a scene at a pier. We were going to drive up to Niven's yacht, uh, Niven's character's yacht, mm-hmm. and I was sitting in a red Ferrari next to R.J. Wagner. And Not my bad. knee was just bouncing up and down because I was so nervous. And R.J. was so kind to me that morning. You know, he was just so lovely. And we talked about sports and kids and all sorts of other things. Uh, and we were sitting in this car. It was right next to an old beat-up sailboat, a very large sailboat that apparently had been... Uh, the sailboat where uh, Errol Flynn had been charged with having sex with an underage girl. Ooh, wow. In the shower, in the shower of this yacht. And uh, the story is, is that the French judge came down to look at the shower. And when he saw how small it was, he said, impossible. And he threw the case out of court. And that, that yacht was sitting there. Um, but that first morning, I sat in a red Ferrari with R.J. Wagner, who was, you know, an idol of mine, who I'd loved in his movies. Uh, uh, Harper was one of my favorite. Oh, we love Harper. We've talked yes. about Harper, yeah. We talked uh, about it with one him. Of my, one of my favorite movies. Great. William uh, Goldman. And, yep. And he's so great in Paul Newman, such a great cast. And then he was in It Takes a Thief, the television series, It Takes a Thief. So so I, I'm just a big fan of his. And there I am sitting in this Ferrari with him, and uh, uh, we pull up. And we play scenes all day long with uh, David Niven and Capucine. It was just uh, like a dream come true. Yeah. And and Robert Loggia you got to work with, too. Oh, my God. Bob yeah. Loggia yeah. was so much fun. Uh, Herbert, Bert Kwok, the whole, the whole cast, everyone was so much fun. Uh, this, is, this is a question I wanted to ask. Oh, but before I jump onto it, just also tell us about Corman, who played Professor Balls. <laughs> 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 and you got to work with him a second time on The Long oh. Shot. Yes, Corman really had a he had ownership of my funny bone. I was a I was a slave to him. We we did a scene where I go to Balls, this guy's artist, to try and see if I could find Clozo, because that's the point of the movie is I'm looking for him. Although why I want to keep looking for him, I don't know. It's uh, I guess that was the point. But um he played Professor Balls. He had this thick German so accent. So funny. And he did this thing early on in the scene where he had the line, he would come in here often browsing for disguises. And he did this really shticky thing. He did, he would come in here often browsing for disguises. And he did this belch <laughs> on the beat. And I couldn't stop laughing. It took about 30 minutes for me to stop laughing. And uh, and he did it great every time. And then um, I got to work with him again on uh, the long shot with uh, Tim Conway and... Uh, Harvey Corman and Jack Weston and Jonathan Winters and uh, what a it group was just uh, I, I they, literally those guys broke one of my ribs from convulsive laughter it was just more than I could take weirdest part of Curse of the Pink Panther I think and I rewatched it and as I was saying to you on the phone there were many good moments in it because you, you know and even the first time you meet Dreyfus and knock him out the window nobody could direct physical comedy and and those kind of set pieces like Blake Edwards yep 
So you're you're not necessarily missing sellers in those moments. But it's very strange to have Roger Moore show up in the movie playing the actual Clouseau. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which really you know, throws it, it into uh, a surreal place. Apparently, uh, while they were uh, uh, enjoying dinner at one of their chateaus in Stad one night, Blake and <laughs> Roger Moore, <laughs> apparently Roger Moore did his Cluzo impersonation. Okay. And, and Blake decided that he wanted Roger to do it in the movie. And so Roger worked for one day and, you know... On a Roger break from Moore, Octopussy, James, I think. James, yeah, James Bond. He, we both had ice buckets stuck on our heads, <laughs> and he was doing a pretty lame Clouseau. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's very, <laughs> it's very, not, not very a good, good Clouseau. <laughs> no, and I remember at one point uh, somebody saying to Roger, "Well, you know, looks like we've got two more setups." And he said, "Oh, really? I thought I'd be done by now." And I said, "Roger, they haven't finished loading the money into your car yet. You're going to have to stay a little bit longer." <laughs> Because they paid him an exorbitant, I don't know what they paid him, but uh, he was a lovely man, spoke so many languages, and was just as gracious as could be. And you went on Carson to promote the film, you were telling me? Oh, goodness, yes. I was, uh, <laughs> he said, when's the premiere? Yeah, Johnny asked me, when's, when's the premiere? Uh, no, he asked me if I was going to the premiere. And I said, uh, I don't think there is one, because MGMUA had, had, had pulled out so, so far away from the film. And I remember it made him laugh uh, for a long time, because every movie has a premiere somewhere, you sure. know, even if it premieres on television as a premiere. So That's where it but got he, ugly, with, with, with Edwards and, and MGM suing each other and, and, and just the whole thing f coming undone at that part. At that it, point. it was. They were pretty unhappy with each other. There was actually a couple of days when we were in the south of France filming Curse of the Pink Panther where everything shut down for a few days because Lee Katz and David Beagleman and a couple of other MGM UA guys came over and had a heart-to-heart -heart with Blake about, I guess, what was being spent or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Movie business, you know, you if you're an actor in the movie business, you you find out really, really quickly that you're a small cog in the wheel, you know. But very I, small. I think every young actor, even knowing they were stepping into a treacherous situation and were going to get slammed, as you said, could not resist the uh, the opportunity to 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 work with these giants to be to to to, to play in that uh, that playground. No, you, you, I, there was just never a question of whether or not I would do it. You know, he, even even when at one point Blake sent me some pages from Stad on the old fax machine paper, you know, back like in the uh, early sure. '80s, and it was really hard to read. And he'd sent me the wrong pages. He'd sent me the scenes from Trail of the Pink Panther, and I took them and I read them, and they were bits that Peter had already done, and I got in a panic and I tried to call Blake at Sh in Stad and there was an 11 hour time difference and Julie Andrews mother was there and she often picked up the phone and she really didn't like me calling she would chastise me for disturbing <laughs> Blackie <laughs> Why are you, young man? Why are you calling? Oh, stop calling us. Leave Blackie alone. I mean, no, I'm going to be in this movie. I'm, I'm a young guy. I'm click, and she'd hang up on me. And, oh, my God. oh, my God. He wants me to do stuff that Peter had already done. And then I found out it was the script, the pages for the other film that got sent to me by mistake. What so. a relief. So you didn't see RJ for all these years until Two and a Half Men? Um, until Two and a Half Men. Yes, and suddenly I'm directing him on Two and a Half Men, and it's so lovely to see him. He looks so great. He's so talented and such a fun person to be with. Yeah, we had a great time. We were thrilled to get him on this show, obviously. Oh, uh, I can imagine. Oh, yeah. yeah, he had fun with Gilbert. Oh. Gilbert, b b Gil well, you heard it. He begged to call him RJ. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, what was it like working with George Burns? Oh, George Burns was amazing. I, uh, oh God, you devil! Oh God, you devil! Written by Andrew Bergman, our, pe our yes. previous our previous guest here, who when the first Oh God movie came out and was so successful, they ordered two two different scripts, two more scripts, and they decided to make the one that they made second second. I don't know why, because I think uh, Andrew's script was so much funnier, um, but. Uh, we had about three days of rehearsal, and the uh, and the wonderful actor Ron Silver, yeah, uh, good actor. It played played my um, what did he play? I think he played my agent. 
Yes, he played he played my agent. And first day of rehearsal, Ron Silver opened up a case and he had some really beautiful Cuban cigars in there. And he said, Hey George, hey George, can I give you a cigar? And George only smoked that cheap El Producto cigar that had a paper wrapper because <laughs> yeah, it was a prop for him. Cheap shit, yeah. Cheap shit. He, he only smoked that because he knew it was always burning. So no matter how long he left it in his fingers, no matter when he took the next puff, it would be lit and he didn't have to relight it. So I don't know that it was about the tobacco enjoyment as much as it was a prop for George. George said, no, 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 thanks. I don't want one. Second day, Ron Silver was like really tenacious. Come on, George, come on, try try one of these cigars. They're so good. You know, this is a great cigar. You should try it. George was like, no, 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 thanks. I don't want that cigar. Third day, Silver is still all over him about trying one of his cigars. And finally, George says to him, would you pay for that cigar? Ron Silver said, I don't know, I think $70, $80, something like that. That And George said, if I paid that much for a cigar, I'd want to fuck it first. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh, my God, we fell out. We just laughed and laughed and laughed. Fantastic. He was so much, he was so much fun to work with. And I do remember the night that he rapped on the picture. We were in a courtyard at a restaurant on La Cienega. <clears throat> And at the entrance to the courtyard, there was a white Rolls Royce and there was a driver in full driver uniform standing there waiting. And I looked over and the, the uh, door to his uh, motorhome opened and a puff of smoke came out and this beautiful blonde haired woman in a really short white dress with incredibly long legs and high heels came out, put her hand up. George's hand reached out, came down the steps with her. Two of them walked arm in arm through the courtyard. The the whole crew split apart like the Red Sea. (laughs) And he was puffing that cigar. And over his shoulder, as he got to the Rolls Royce, he said, so long, suckers. And he got in the Rolls Royce. (laughs) Oh, it's like the great, like you could not. That's exactly how you want to picture George Burns. You could not choreograph that exit any better. <laughs> Everything but the like, closing iris. Yeah, I was like, George fucking Burns. Oh, my God. Legend. He was, he was amazing. Did he tell you vaudeville stories? Did he ever mention Swain's Rats and Cats? Do you know about that, Ted? No. Okay. I, I, it sounds familiar. I think, you know, I do It was an animal sitting, act he worked with in vaudeville. Oh. Yeah. I do remember sitting close to him and, you know, I just, I would say, tell me about Jack Benny. And he would tell me stories about Jack Benny. Unfortunately, I can't remember any of them, <laughs> but it was so much fun just being around him and listening to him talk about Gracie and Burns or uh, wow. Benny and all of his friends. Did you find him a little bit demanding to work with? Uh, you know I, what? I heard. I, I, yeah, boy, you, you just, you know everything, don't you? I don't know. <laughs> How just do you know these things? Extra work. He was, yes, he was very demanding. In fact, er, uh, early on in the day, he was, he was, well, he was demanding all day long and we'd have scenes and I was often giving him the setup to a, to a, a, a joke. And he sometimes wouldn't like how I was I was setting him up, but he would go, "Come on, come on, come on! You know you got to feed that to me faster. You're crumbing this whole thing. You're crumbing this whole thing. Too. Come on, you gotta." And I go, George, George, I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna give it to you. Great, it's gonna be hanging out over the plate, and you're gonna drive it deep. But you can't tell me how to say it. And you go, "Come on, kid. Come on, I'm waiting for you. Don't hang me out there, kid. You're crumbing this thing." I go, "Okay, you're crumbing okay. it." <laughs> Crumming it. I'd be crumming it. Oh, he was so funny. And he was always right, too, you know, no matter what, no matter what he said. He's George Ultimately, Burns, for God's sakes. Yeah. yeah, he's George Burns. Ultimately, I gave him everything he wanted. I didn't care. It was so much fun. Yeah. Let, let me let me go back to soap just just uh, to talk about some of these great actors. We mentioned we mentioned uh, uh, also the great Susan Harris and, and Paul Witt and Tony Thomas, who were early champions of yours and then remain so. Uh, uh, through your career, talented people, but how, how did you get soap? Did you audition six times? Do I have this right? Good Lord Almighty! Yes, I did. <laughs> they called me back f- after my first audition. They called me back five more times until finally I was in the the network reading 
with maybe 30 network executives in a very small office. Back then, they didn't have the big theatrical kind of uh, casting rooms that they have now. It was just packed in there. But yeah, I auditioned six times to, to get the part of Danny Dallas. Even though oh, you I didn't want to so do a TV series. I didn't want to do a television series, and then I would have crawled through glass, broken glass for that part. I loved it so much. You were great on that show. Oh, thanks. I mean, so many people were great on that show. And we were, Gilbert and I were talking about the actors, not only the main cast, Robert Guillaume, oh. who was wonderful, and Catherine Hellman, who was wonderful. Like Jack Guilford. But guest stars like Jack yeah. Guilford and Gregory Sierra. and What was Guilford D- like Dick Libertini. to work with? He was he was just glorious. He was up in the spaceship with uh, Richard Mulligan yes. in season three. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And there's you know there's there's an incredible outtake of those little Martians that the what they had the big rubber heads and one of them is about to go through the the automatic door and uh, and the door comes down too soon and hits him right at the top of the rubber head and he can't get through and it's a, it's a hysterical piece of outtake. But Jack Guilford, uh, you know, I wish I'd had more to do with him. That was when Richard Mulligan was was on the spaceship up in the sky. With I remember. Him. So so <laughs> yeah. so he was kind of off off on his own, but. Uh, but he was lovely. Guilford was just a lovely man. Yeah. You had that whole wonderful first season too. I mean, they gave you a lot to do when you got there. They gave you a workload. You had you were you were uh, working for Libertini, the Godfather, and you had to bump off. And I, by the way, Mulligan, a very very funny guy, a very funny a physical actor, hilarious. Speaking of Blake Edwards, sob. There's a connection. Yes, uh- Bla- uh, Richard was uh, phenomenal in SOB. It's and that's still one of my. That's a great showbiz movie. It is. It is a great, great show. Uh, 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 Underrated. Robert Preston, Larry Hagman, Robert Weber, Robert Wab- Weber, and, yeah. and and Richard Mulligan. Those guys are so funny. Robert Vaughn is so funny. Everybody, in that movie. everybody, everybody that's in that movie. Shelley Winters. They're Shelley Winters. Also, they're all so funny. But yes, they. Uh, Stuart Margolin. Stuart Margolin. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, the first season of Soap was was just glorious. The table reads, they spread the laugh spread was so huge because no one could keep a straight face. Susan wrote such such incredible scripts that the whole way through, but uh, the cast was amazing, and and it was everybody who was supposed to play that part. Everyone who was cast in that show was born to play the part, and uh, you know there weren't any of those ideas, <laughs> casting ideas. Hey, this guy's really popular. Why don't you use him? No, it was everybody John was... John Biner, too. Oh, John Biner. Yeah, who we had here. Uh, yeah, Harold Gould Harold was on Gould. the show. Yeah, another, another great oh, character wow. actor. They, I mean, they, they, she really cast that show within an inch of its life. Yes. I mean, it was very, very well written. Talk to me a, a, a bit, Ted, about the controversy surrounding the show. You know, it's funny because the 70s, nobody would bat an eye now. So much has changed. Obviously, you didn't have pay cable then, but, you know, alien abductions, exorcisms, adultery, mental illness, demonic possession, sex changes, all of this stuff <laughs> yeah, that, and don't that she was attempting. Uh, uh, Diana Canova's uh, character was uh, trying to have an affair with the priest. Uh, that, right. So, yes. So, you know, that's right. And, and, and what happened was the storylines got leaked uh, uh, late in the spring after ABC had picked it up. Yeah. And uh, there's that Newsweek network, article. Yeah, network was taking twenty, thirty thousand letters a week in protest of the show, and they actually liked receiving the letters. They just thought, well, this is going to be like instant tune in for us. You know, we'll just play up the controversy, and then shortly, uh, shortly before this, uh, the series premiered in the fall. The letters stopped coming to the network, and they started sending them more specifically to advertisers in in New York. And that's when the show actually became a little bit in jeopardy about going on the air. And when it finally did go on the air, it was never really fully advertised. It always sold uh, advertising time at, at a discounted rate because it just had that stigma of being too controversial for network television. Would you remember the controversy, Gilbert, about soap at yes, the, at the yeah. time? I mean, the Council of Bishops, the Church of Christ, the National Council of Churches, the Methodist Church, uh, the L.A. Archdiocese actually urged boycotts. They urged families to boycott the show. Always, You can always count on the church to censor art. 
even a bo- even a board of rabbis, Gilbert, the board the board of rabbis of, of Southern California. Bef- as, as, and as Ted says, before the show even aired, there were letter writing campaigns. There was pressure on sponsors. Did what did the cast make of all this? Well, uh, we how was it affecting frightened. you guys? We were frightened. We were we were back in Los Angeles. Most of us lived in New York at the time. We were back in Los Angeles. We were making episodes, and we knew it was great. I mean, we all just had a sense that it was um, really different tonally than anything that that we'd seen on television before. It was so smart and so funny, and we were. At a certain point, we all got really worried. We were frightened that maybe ABC would cave and and not put the show on. But uh, we were all very, very happy and relieved that they did. She was brave, mm-hmm. and and also to to portray a gay character the way they did. I mean, that's the the, the one of the that, brilliant things about the show. Yeah, that was a funny uh, Billy Crystal. Yeah, was Jody, gay, and it was like now it's it's almost like tiresome. That in every show, there has to be like, okay, uh, let's edit it. We need the gay best friend. And, wasn't and back then, that was shocking. Ahead of its time. It, it, re- it really was. Uh, but, you know, sometimes somebody has to go through the door first, you know, and, and, and so we did. But wasn't Billy great in that part? Wonderful. Yes. So wonderful. 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 And a, and a testament he, to Susan's t- talent that she could turn on a dime and write a sensitive scene for him and not, not treat him as a cartoon. Yep. I remember Billy and I had a great scene. Billy, by the way, it was another owner of my funny bone. Like He was always cracking me up. Uh, but Billy and I played a really wonderful scene that I'll always remember where uh, the mob is out to... To kill me now because I didn't I didn't kill Bert and, <laughs> yes. and I'm gonna leave home. And before I leave home, Billy's character wants me to finally accept the fact that he's gay, and my character didn't want to believe it. And uh, it's really, really a lovely scene. Very, very powerful. I remember it's such a great job in that scene. It was really, you know, it's one of those scenes that you look back on. And you go, that was good. Yeah, was really proud good. of it. You should be. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's really groundbreaking television. Thanks. I just have a piece of paper here, Gil. You're going to enjoy this. This was this is the soap memo. I found this doing deep research. You know about this? No. This, this was the standards and practices memo that was leaked to the press before the show premiered, uh, uh, and and printed its entirety, printed in its entirety in the L.A. Times on June twenty seventh, nineteen seventy seven. These were the notes. From the network, from Standards and Practices. You guys will appreciate this. Please delete the lines, the slut, that Polish slut, get your clothes off. It didn't grow back. Transsexual, oh my God, and did it hurt. Please substitute the words fruit, slut, and Tinkerbell. In, in, in order to treat Jody as a gay character, his portrayal must at all times be handled without limp-wristed actions. The... The conversation between Peter and Jessica, which relates to cunnilingus slash fellatio, is obviously unacceptable. <laughs> oh, my God. The relationship between Jody and the football player, played by great Bob Segrin, should be handled in such a manner that explicit or intimate aspects of homosexuality are invo- avoided entirely. Father Flotsky's stand on ribal- uh, liberalizing the mass will have to be treated in a balanced, inoffensive manner. By way of example, the substitution of Oreos for the traditional wafer is unacceptable. (laughs) (laughs) And my favorite, please change Burt Campbell's last name to avoid association with the Campbell Soup Soup Company. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wouldn't want to offend them, would we? That's hysterical. Yeah, you didn't know this existed? It's crazy. And and I will say that that as, as fearful as we were, the cast was at a, at a certain point when we heard how much controversy there was. I do want to say that Paul Witt, Tony Thomas, and Susan Harris really protected us from so much of that. Jay Sandridge was the great director in that first season. Oh, yes. I learned Legend. so much from him. But but Paul, who's passed away not too long ago, yes. who I really loved, and was an amazingly gifted man, such a lovely person, um, they they all kept our heads up. You know, they all kept us feeling like it's going to be okay. We're going to get on the air. We're going to be successful, and uh, and we were. Yeah, but, it's a terrific but, show. But it always got me. It's like they were like in old movies and old TV. They were 
blatantly gay people, but as like l- Edward Everett Horton, yeah, those kind of gay yeah, character actors, Paul yeah. Lynn, Billy yeah. DeWolf, sure. And it's like, as long as you didn't say they were, then they were eccentric. Yes. Gail Gordon, Franklin Pangborn. <laughs> and, and now it's like, the, the, you know, every romantic comedy, she has to have a gay best friend. Right. But right. back then, it was a shocking thing. Well, I also, you know, again, I have to say that I thought Billy did such a great job. He did. You know, is that he just... Played him like a human being. He, he was did. completely human in that part, and uh, and uh, he did a great job. Let's talk about you becoming a director in the '90s. And we were trying before we turned the mics on, just for our listeners, G- uh, Gilbert and and uh, Ted were trying to figure out where they knew each other from because <laughs> they had met once. We can't put our finger on it. I think he must have auditioned for you somewhere along the line, maybe for Blossom or. Or one of those shows you were directing back in the '90s, but at some point you became disenchanted with acting and said, "I want to direct. I want to. I want to approach this from a different place." Yeah, sometime, <clears throat> sometime during the late '80s, I, I I remember coming home from days working on a set, <clears throat> acting, and feeling like uh, I'd had a good day, but it it wasn't it wasn't as thrilling. the The feeling wasn't as strong. And right around that same time, I noticed that I was <clears throat> coaching a couple of actors, uh, and there were some actors that would call me when they had auditions to come over, and I would work with them with, on their auditions. There was a couple of playwrights I was working with. Um, and all of a sudden, I just had one of those moments where I, I'd pursued an acting career for so long, it didn't. It, I couldn't even let the light in of possibly being a director. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I had one of those moments where I thought, Oh my God! I I really think I should be a director. I think I think I think like a director, and so in the late eighties, I started trying to get some directing opportunities, which didn't pan out. And then Paul Witt, Tony Thomas, and my friend Don Rio had a series called Blossom, and they they offered me the part of the dad, and I I turned them down through my agent and they got really mad and they called me up and Tony <laughs> Thomas was like, Oh, what the, what the fuck, man? You can't just say no to us. You have to come in. And I was like, okay, okay, I'll come in. I'll come in. So I went in to see them. Three of them were sitting there and there were, you know, Tony was like, why, why don't you want to play this part, man? We're just trying to give you a lot of money and a civilized way of life. Why, why wouldn't you play this part? And I said, well, I, I, I don't want to be an actor anymore. I want to be a director. And there was a beat and then the three of them just exploded in laughter like it was the funniest <laughs> freaking thing you could ever say. And I s- remember sitting there just like going, oh, my God, what in the hell is going on here? And finally they stopped laughing. And Tony Thomas said, you want to direct the show? We'll let you direct the show. Play the part. We'll let you direct the show. And that's how I got the part. On that's, Blossom. that's how you became Nick Russo. That's how I became Nick Russo. Yep. And I started directing episodes of Blossom uh, 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 in the early in the second season. Directed eighteen of yeah. the hundred and thirteen that we made. Yes, yeah. was that character based on Dion, the singer Dion DeMucci? Y- you know, Don Rio, my friend Don Rio, and Dion DeMucci are good friends, and I, I don't know that I've ever heard Don say that, but it's very possible that he is. How interesting! Now, yeah. now, what do you find different from about TV directing? Like, as opposed to film directing. I mean, well, I, I always wondered, like, because every time I see, like, an actor's name uh, and directed by an actor in the series, I always wonder what they actually did. Well, I think it's, I think the first required skill required understanding for being a director is the understanding of the story because you're going to tell the story with performance and picture and and all the other means that we have at our at our disposal but um working with actors and shaping performances performance management and working with the dp and the camera operators and making shots and Blocking it, it's 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 very exciting. It's a very very exciting job. You know, in in this in the multiple camera business, you know, we we have a live audience, and so our proscenium is set, which means that we're shooting most of our coverage uh, 
while we're filming the entire scene, which is really challenging because you have to know how to block it. You have to know how to stage a scene so it can be filmed that way. Um, and it doesn't afford us a lot of opportunities to tell a lot of the story with picture, which is a big difference when you're working in single camera or directing films. You get to tell a little bit more story with, with, with the camera rather than tell it with the dialogue. The multiple camera world is all about the dialogue. Do you love working with the old pros? Was was that one uh, perk of the job, Ted? When you when, people like Barnard Hughes, for instance, these 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 veteran actors with all of these chops. I noticed in doing deep research that you directed Kathleen Freeman in an episode of Caroline <laughs> in the City, who was the the actress from Jerry Lewis's stock company, and Earl oh Holloman, God. and oh some God. some of these wonderful actors that we talk about on this show because we have a love affair with character actors. Is, well, it, I, is that just pure joy, these people walking on the set? And It, it is pure joy. And, and to have grown up a student, uh, you know, uh, of entertainment. Th- Phyllis Diller is Phil- another one. Oh, Phyllis Diller. Oh, yeah. my God. You know, and, the, and, and to have these people walk on to a set that uh, where I'm directing, and I love them. I love their work. They made me laugh. They made me cry. I've loved their work for years and years and years. And finally, to have the opportunity to work with them and help them shine. Do you go up, will be, you go up and, and say that to them? Oh, yeah. Be absolutely. so forthcoming as to say? Some, oh, absolutely. Somebody uh, like Earl Holloman walks on the set or Shatner, oh, yeah. who you got to direct and shit my dad says? Oh, my God. Shatner. Well, we talked about that. Yeah. Judgment at Nuremberg. I mean, he's made... He's done so much in his career, and he's such an amazing actor, and he's so much fun to be around. Um, but yeah, it's to, the opportunity to walk up and say, uh, shake their hand or say hello and say, I'm a great fan of your work. I've loved your work. And, and to be able to talk about it specifically in moments maybe that they've played, um, it's a big thrill for me. I enjoy that part of it. And what about re- directing Richard Kind? <laughs> 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 is that the biggest thrill? <laughs> you know what the biggest. He's thrill listening. Is that, you know, he set this up, so we're we're, we're going to have to throw him a bone. Richard, see the the challenge with Richard is to always get him to try and do it just a little bit bigger. Just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bierko's line up that he said to Richard. Or, do you know this line? No. Which he one? said the two things that are visible from space are the Great Wall of China and every acting choice that Richard Kind has ever made. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Richard makes me laugh. I, I hope such I a got great... that right, Richard. You got that right. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. I... What was James Coburn? Oh, you played James Coburn's son. Oh, that's right. Sins of the father. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, it was. Uh, yeah, we were father and son, and we were both having an affair with uh, Glennis O'Connor, uh, which kind of is a. a a steamy subject matter for a television movie, what, in the 1980s, yeah, I think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, directed by Peter Werner. That's right. Um, yeah, you know, James Coburn, I, Magnificent Seven. Magnificent Seven. Like, I can watch that movie anytime it comes on. And each one of those great stars in that movie has a flawless moment, has many flawless moments. He's spectacular. He was so kind. He was so generous. There was a scene that we did where I'm sitting in a restaurant with Glennis. We're having dinner. And James comes in. Jim comes in. And he sits down. And and, um, and, and during this scene... He just kind of quietly reaches out and puts his hand on Glennis O'Connor's hand. And, and I just jumped up. I jumped up from the table like uh, it was scripted that, that I leave. And, uh, and director called cut and we came back. He said, let's go again. And I remember Jim Coburn saying to me, wait, don't go so fast this time. Just take your time and look at everything. And it was such a great note. And it was so generous of another actor to give me that note. You know, I mean, you hear about actors who maybe aren't so generous, but he was incredibly generous. Did you ever meet him, Gilbert, in your travels? No. James Coburn? Never met James Coburn. Okay, I got Great Escape? Oh, sure, all of them. We love him in in Charade, the Stanley Donnan movie. And all his Flint movies. All the Flint pictures. (laughs) Yeah, and like Flint, yeah. Okay, I have something here. Now, this may be it. Uh Uh-oh. You did two, in 1981, Ted, if IMDb is not bullshitting me, you did two appearances on Thick of the Night. 
Oh, jeez. Could that be where you met Gilbert, who was a repertory player on that show? Oh, my God. In Canada. No, right? no. You're on the really early uh, Alan Thicke show. Oh, you were on the Alan Thicke show? Or were you on Thick of the Night? Wait a minute. Yeah, Thick I'm of confused. the Night was in uh, L.A. Maybe I got it wrong. That's when he moved here and he was going to be, he was going to knock Carson off the air and and like I always say, Carson's not on the air anymore, so it works. <laughs> Mission accomplished, huh? My research him. is you did the, the, the Alan Thicke show with Michelle, one with Michelle Pfeiffer and one with Marjo Gortner. Uh, Frank, you're amazing. I, you, that's exactly right. Okay. But I, th- I, I, my recollection is, is that we were in Vancouver. Then I'm giving you bad info. Then it was the Alan Thicke show, which yeah. may have preceded Thicker the Night. Okay, I thought I had solved the mystery. Before we get out of here... And I'm you, go- yes, you work with Charlie Sheen? Oh, yes. Anything about Charlie that you can say? Uh, of course. I love Charlie Sheen. I directed all the episodes of Spin City that uh, that Charlie Sheen uh, did after Michael J. Fox retired from the show. And, um, and I think Charlie- Martin was on one of those, too. Who's that? I think you directed The Old Man, too. I did, yes. Yeah. There was a there was an episode where, where Martin came on and... Uh, and we had a they had a scene where they played pool together. It was so much fun to have the two of them together. Charlie was a complete gentleman and he was dedicated to the work and he was very generous. We had a lot of laughs together. Our kids used to play together. We had a lot of fun. And I'm glad to hear that he's doing well right now. Now yeah, that that is somebody I, I Gilbert worked, knows. Yeah, I worked with him once. Uh, on a, on an episode of Anger Management, and he was very nice, very friendly. What I remember, though, is taking being in a car, being driven to the airport to go out to L.A. to do that show, and and they, I get a call, and the halfway to the airport, they said, uh, "Oh, we're uh, postponing that uh, this episode." Because Charlie broke his nose jumping into the swimming pool. Yikes. And, and, and I thought, I wonder if he even has a swimming pool. Oh, well, yeah. maybe, he did, maybe he didn't notice there wasn't any water yes, in it. I yeah. don't know. Oh, okay, so you, you promised you'd tell him about Cosby and the models before we get out of here. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> According to what I heard... From uh, two of the writers of the Cosby Show, because I worked on uh, the original one, yeah. right? The, oh, the 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 Huxtable one. Yeah, yeah. And they said that in the schedule, uh, Bill Cosby had a uh, certain section of time set aside where he taught comedy to Asian models. <laughs> <laughs> Ted's head has slumped down onto the table. Oh, good Lord. Oh. Oh, they were probably paying him for that, too, I'll bet. Oh, good Lord. And you, and you work with Carrie Fisher. Yes, on the, oh. on the Tony Randall project. Yeah. Yes, Carrie Fisher and I played uh, opposite each other in a, in a television film where... Tony Randall and I get in each other's cars. That's the kind of buy on the on the thing. And <clears throat> I end up taking Tony Randall's car, and he's got his his niece and nephew are in the back seat, and and Carrie's hitchhiking, and I pick her up, and we have all these adventures. We were stuck in that car for hours and hours and hours, and I remember her telling me that she was she's just out of rehab, and I'm sorry that she's gone. She was really lovely, Uh-oh. but. She yeah. was just out of rehab, and she was getting a lot of calls uh, from people who were, they were calling to find out how she was doing, but they were basically, hey, how's it going? How's it going? Everything all right? Are you doing okay? And uh, she would tell me during the day how many different calls and from who she got them from. And at one point I said, uh, I, I went, ring, ring, ring. And she looked at me and I said, it's for you. And we ring, 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 and finally she said hello. And I'm not a very good impressionist, but I said, Carrie, it's Darth. I'm just calling to see how you're feeling. Are you doing okay? And we had a lot of laughs and laughed and laughed and laughed. Um, 
she's a loss. I, oh I'm yeah, sad. big loss. I'm sad that she's gone. A yeah. big loss. And you know, yeah. it's funny. We've we've had a, a run of guests on the show. We had Beverly D'Angelo recently. Who was a good friends with her. Griffin Dunn, who was she keeps coming up on the on this show. She connected. She she touched so many people. She connected to so many people. Wonderful writer. Yeah. Really terrific actress, great presence. Self-deprecating, didn't take herself yes. seriously. Yes, and the books are so good. She wrote so well. So, Before yeah. we get you out of here, yes, uh, sir, uh, Ted, and this has been great, I just have a question, and this, uh, this was a question actually from a, a, a listener. We do this thing called Grill the Guest. Uh, David De La Fuente, this is also a question I'm wondering, were any of you guys told what the ending of Soap was? Absolutely not. It In just fact, ended. I don't. I, I, you know, we finished our fourth season. And we always had cliffhangers. We didn't know really what was going to happen in the in the next season. Um, but when we finished that fourth season, I remember I'd been having an affair with Bob Mandon's wife, and he had a gun on me. I think four or five of us had guns on us, <laughs> and we all could have been killed. And I think it was probably a negotiating ploy from the network. But uh, we never found out what might have happened because uh, it didn't get a fifth season. So they just pulled the plug. By yeah. the way, by the way, a couple other actors we didn't mention: Howard Hesseman, wonderful. Oh yes, the great Roscoe Lee Brown. Oh, and somebody we talked about on the phone uh, on the telephone, Eugene Roach. Oh, Eugene Roche was so funny. Another wonderful guy. Oh my wonderful God, what actor. a lovely man he was. Yeah. yeah. And you had, and we, I was just going to say, we lost in the last three years, Donnelly Rhodes, we lost Catherine Hellman just a couple of months ago, Robert Mandan died last year, Robert Guillaume, but you got to have a reunion. Well, Jay Sandrich actually put this together, I think it's about five years ago now that he did this, he invited everybody to come out to a dinner uh, and we all had an opportunity to say hello and, and catch up for a brief period of time. Mo most everyone was there, and uh, you could see that Bob Bob Guillaume was, was uh, not in great health, and you could also see Bob Mandan wasn't either. But it was so lovely to see them all, you know, and you... you create such a deep bond with a cast when you're when you're with them so many hours a day and then the show finally ends and you you stay in touch with a lot of people but uh slowly over the years sometimes they just seem to slip away and um, i'm very grateful to jay sandrich for a lot of things i learned a lot from him uh watching him work but uh, for getting us all together that last time that's sweet what a body yeah. of work uh what a resume for jay sandrich by the way yeah, I, yeah, you know, more Emmys and more successful shows than we can even imagine. It's, He's a great director and it, a lovely man. It's staggering. Yeah. Gilbert? Any, yeah. Anything else for Ted? Or are wake we going to let Gilbert. him go practice his... his <laughs> what do you say? Uh, I'm, just, I'm just joking. I said, wake up, Gilbert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's so disappointed that you wouldn't sing. Yes. Well, you, maybe next time. Okay. <laughs> you know, next time we talk, you have to tell about tell us about the Lewis Black Pilot. <laughs> oh, I'd love to tell you about the Lewis Black Pilot. I'd love to tell you about Sir John Gilgood next time. So, okay, uh, or Gary David Goldberg, another another hero of mine. A giant. What an amazing talent. Yeah. Yep. We'll do it again. All right. Okay, so this has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. And we have been talking to the wonderful Ted Wash. Who paid you a lovely compliment. Uh, a that beautiful, I, beautiful compliment. Yes, that I don't think you quite deserve. No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Krista Rose who helped me with research. It's not all me, Ted. <laughs> okay. And I, we want to thank Richard Kind. Who Richard. wrote me. We love you. He wrote me and said, what about Ted Wass? And I said, damn, Skippy, we have to have Ted Wass. And you were great, man. And and you know what? Give my love to your family. I will. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm remarried to, to Nina Wass, who's an amazing oh, yes. producer She's... and uh, puts a lot of shows on the air with Ryan Seacrest Productions. And we have a beautiful 14-year-old daughter together named Stella. So uh, life is wonderful. Good. Ted, it's been yeah. a great ride, huh? Yeah. Was your stepfather proud of you? Yeah, did he get over? Yes. Did he get over yeah, it? He's very pleased. Okay, yeah. Good. <laughs> as soon as I made some big money. As okay. soon as I made some big money. That's what it was about. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Richard Kind. All right. Okay, Thanks, buddy. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Our pleasure.